Welcome to the Red Pill Podcast, where we give you the brutal reality of truth. Today's guest, Eric Benet. A lot of stuff going on with Eric Benet, man. We're going to talk to this brother about a lot, about the neo-soul movement he was a part of. Where is everyone and why didn't we appreciate India Ari? We're also going to talk to him about Jay-Z. And if there's any beef between him and Hove after Hove name checked him on 444, where are these brothers at right now? Um, he also mentions being white in R&B. Do you have to be white to be a successful traditional R&B singer today? That's very interesting stuff we get into. And the last most interesting thing is what it was like when he found out that his current wife used to be married to Prince. How do you date someone or marry someone that was with Prince? Ah, oh, it's crazy, man. Pop some pills, get ready for it. His brother was very, very, very open and honest. White people, clap, give it up for a legend. Ah. A music legend. Give it up for Eric Benet right now. Give it up for Eric Benet, wow. man. Thank you, white people. I yes. love this. Now, love from um, the colonizers. Yes, I, I think love from the colonizers. I yes. love this. I think that we've done. I think that we've done like a. Uh, I think really the only person that we've maybe had on the podcast that had as big a reputation in sort of like the sexy nigga categories as you do is probably what Tay Diggs. Mm -hmm. Like Jason had a big. That's, that's sexy nigga. That's that sexy nigga yeah. category yeah. right there. What about right, Dolbeck yeah. Quinn? Huh? What about Dolbeck Quinn? Dovet Quince has it, but it's different because he's more like self-help sexy nigga. Uh, you know what I'm saying? It's my goal in life is to one day, like even just for one summer, be like a sexy nigga. But that's hilarious to me because I am so not the sexy nigga. I am the, I am the go home. I got my wife and I, we have a six year old and a four year old. Yeah. Now. I mean, to her, I hope it's sexy, but- Dog, like, you used to sing with your shoes off. I did. I sang with my shoes off. First of off. all, before we even go anywhere. Yeah. I, I got to tell a story. My dad is somewhere listening to this. Oh, I want to hear this. And so we're in, I think it was a late, a late night show, right? Okay. And so we're in the, um, we're all in the living room where we're watching this. And my mom and my sister are transfixed by a television. They're watching you sing. And my dad always, you could always know when my dad was irked about something. Because he comes in. What's wrong with that boy? Ain't got no shoes on. Hell yeah. <laughs> comes in. Comes in. And, it, and my mama goes, and my mama's just like, oh my God. Like he is. And my dad's going, what you talking about? This nigga ain't got no fucking shoes on, man. I could take my shoes off right now and do the same <laughs> shit. That's no home training right there. Yeah, put some shoes on. What was the shoeless thing about? I I've never known. What was the so, thing? Do you still do it? Now, I haven't done it in so long. The whole shoeless thing started because when I first, I got my first record deal. Eric used to, for, for y'all who don't know, Eric was was notorious for being in videos and live performances. He bare, would, bare ass, like no shoes. shoes. No shoes. I might show up to your event wearing no damn shoes. No shoes. <laughs> <laughs> but the the no shoes thing started because my sister and I, mm -hmm. I got my first record deal with my sister. We were a brother sister duo. We okay. were called Benet. So, you know, we we got signed and the record label kind of halfway sort of threw out a single. And then after the single didn't blow up, they just dropped us. Mm -hmm. And so my sister was like, you mean we just spent like my sister quit her job. She had a nice job. She quit mm -hmm. her job flew out to LA to record this album. My sister was like, you mean to tell me I quit my job. We flew out to LA, recorded this damn album. They halfway threw out one single and we got dropped. She was like, I'm done, I'm out. Out. So I was like, I, I started working on my solo thing. And so eventually I got another record deal. I got signed to Warner Brothers. And I got so stage fright going out on the, sh on the stage because I was so used to seeing my sister right there whenever I performed. Mm -hmm that, you know, I would get crazy stage fright backstage. So one day I just like took off my shoes and that really calmed me down. And I went out oh. there and I did the show without my shoes. And I was able, my voice was less shaky and uh -huh. I was less stage frighty. And then women were reacting to the, well, you gotta remember y'all, this is like the 90, early nineties. Right. They was reacting to barefoot ass, the you know, right. The hammer time on my toes. They didn't yeah. care, it was just like, you know what's crazy? Wow. That's actually, did you did you do that purposely? Did you take your shoes off or did you just do it instinctively? I just did it kind of instinctively just to like calm myself. You know, that's a, I've, we talked about this before. That's actually a, um, a technique 
to calm your anxiety down. Well, I ain't even know. It's called grounding. I grounded my ass. <laughs> I you get like you like they like, I used to have anxiety attacks. You take your shoes off. Yeah, exactly. You go walk around and you feel like, more connected. Yeah, you feel good. You're absolutely so, right. So see, I didn't see. You know what, bro? That's good that you said that, man. Because I thought you was on some bullshit, man. You know what's I thought funny? You was on some. <laughs> um, I thought you was really on some Extra neo soul, granola like, bullshit, like yeah. smoking. Because I incense. used to look at you. I used to look at guys like you and Maxwell and Kid Lattimore and be like, these niggas got a dark side. Like, what's going on with these barefoot ass like? Like, like it just like I used to look at y'all and be like, I don't trust him because he doesn't have his <laughs> shoes on. <laughs> but you're, but you're a good guy. That's you know funny I mean? that you say that because I've run into that a few times with you know like some people, new people were coming to the record label, and mm -hmm. because I think what happened was once I started to go bare feet, like the label, the label was like, oh, let's build on that, let's mm -hmm. make them so bohemian and let's make him real yeah 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 yeah. you know like you know cockle shells and his dreadlocks kind of <laughs> right. so they kind of i kind of worked with a stylist that kind of accentuated that a little bit and that was the wave then too that was the wave yeah but then when i would hang out with people uh especially new people that were coming to the label that were head of marketing or head of promotion and they would get to know me and they're like you know what right I thought you was gonna be one of them granola must crutches, man. You just a cool regular hangout, you know. Right. You know, so yeah. Yeah. So when describe to me um what it's like to be to go from having that situation where it's you and your sister and things don't work out. Yeah. So then you being solo and things really start to work out. Well it was it was uh it was really interesting because just as a musician, um uh uh, the the situation with my sister and I it was more controlled by the label there wasn't as much autonomy mm -hmm. as much freedom and so when I decided to uh, try to go at myself I made the decision that look we put my sister was right we did put all that time and energy and quit our jobs and 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 uh, made this project and then at the end of the day the record label had more control over the project and then the single didn't go and you dropped us so i told myself look if i ever get this opportunity again i'm gonna have control right i'm gonna have control over like the music i'm gonna produce the music i'm gonna write the music with the people i want to record with and so i named the album true to myself so it was really empowering um to finally do a project the way that i wanted to do and you know, sink or swim is my Based fault. Based on your own my uh, vision. creative energy, yeah. My vision, and we're talking about, you know, we're talking like I grew up. I grew up in the '70s, so mm -hmm. I grew up. You know, my my musical food was 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 Earth, Wind, and Fire, and Marvin Gaye, and Donny Hathaway, and the Beatles, and 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 Queen, and Stevie Wonder. So, so my music like had all of that had a, all that 70s influence and they apparently there was a whole bunch of other cats that wanted to make albums that had that kind of influence too and they put us in a little category and called us neo soul was it beef did you ever see maxwell like yo fuck this nigga. like like yo look maxwell you trying to steal my look like not you not in the least bit but now that you mention it it's like <laughs> no max, max is cool i love max but right. it's like the press always try to make beef yeah. when it ain't no beef ain't i mean no beef. They, they tried to make beef with you and maxwell maybe not so much the press i did see some some reviews where they would try to go some kind but mostly it was just like you know blogs people mm. you know putting up these competitions uh between me and other neo soul artists where i'm like you know it's not, it's not a competition it's i used to art. see that you know i used to see well, they do the same thing in hip-hop so. yeah they do the same thing in hip-hop and hip-hop is a little bit different to me though because the guys are they're competitive by nature. They want to be competitive. Right. But I remember the first time good I ever point. Well, like they want to be competitive. They want to be a really the, good the point. best MC. You know what I mean? And it's like uh, like like artists like me, we were usually, I mean, speaking for myself, I was always I'm I i do not want to say insecure, but I guess, yeah, artistically, I've always been kind of like, wow, that could be better. I could have did that a little bit better. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there's the bravado and the hip hop where right. it's like yeah. whereas in y'all was just, you know kind of different i remember i read an article one time and it was about i was maybe 13 or 14 and the article was about brandy hmm. and i remember reading this article because i like 1994 95 mm -hmm. dog like i was in love with brandy 
in love. Brandy's I, dope. I want to be down. Yeah. I was in love with Brandy. Oh my God. Still one of the best voices, underrated. Just how great she can sing. Incredible. Like, incredible voice. And I remember reading an article about Brandy and they were like, Brandy has all the innocence that Aaliyah wished she had. Yeah. And I was thinking to myself, why they do that? Like, why? 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 Do like, that? like, why? Why? Aaliyah didn't have shit to do with this. Aaliyah's doing her thing. Brandy's yeah, doing her doing thing. Doing it well. Everybody's successful. I'm like, yeah. why do they do that? Like, what's the point of 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 doing that? Man, like, you know, it's not like Brandy was like, "Yo, I'm the dopest singer ever off the block," and trying to like battle people and stuff right. like that. So I always, I always wondered about that. Did you guys feel? Um, did you feel that competition? Did you feel like, "Yo, I gotta come out and I gotta I would do only, something different"? Than I never felt. Uh, I never felt the pressure of trying to be better than anybody else. I mean, other than I felt the, the self-inflicted pressure mm -hmm. where I would listen to I would listen to previous projects and I would be like, like what a, I hate listening to my albums because you don't like I'm it. always producing it. You mm -hmm. know, it's like, oh, man, I should have raised the vocal right there. I'm talking about a record that was recorded like 12 years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, ah, oh, why didn't I put a harmony on that note? Right. So it's like um, I'm just generally uh i have pressure on myself but i never i never ever like any like beef you know if i see music or if i see mac somewhere it's just it's all love it's, it's all all, love. Yeah. yeah yeah so speaking of rap wait first of all first of all i just want to like give i mean i know everybody probably who does your podcast just gotta like give it up to you but bruh what you channel the voice of all colored people <laughs> And I, I'm not, I ain't gonna go into too much detail, right. but like while it was happening, I was watching it in real time. I was just like, yes, I appreciate that, dog. Yes, so you were just it, like, but the thing about it was you didn't just say it, but you said it with eloquence and love. You know, you you said it from love. We gotta love each other. Yeah. yeah so man. it was, you know, there were many ways you could handle that or not handle it, handled it at all. Mm -hmm. I was so glad that you did handle it, and the way you handled it was just so. Like, I don't think I could have, like, I would have been well, somewhere in my uh, subconscious, I would have been thinking that, but I don't think I would have been able to, like, use the words that you did in that moment so, so let, well. So let's, let's talk about that then before we move on to what I was going to do. What, what were your thoughts on that and um, that entire thing and you being someone right. that is a, uh, that uses your voice? Yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts on the responsibility of artists to lend their, their voices to the current political divide in America? Yes. Well, um, I have so many thoughts about that. And I think it's very difficult not just to be an artist, but to be a human being today. Uh, not just to be an American, but to be a human being. Not just to be a man, but to be a human being. And like seeing what's being perpetuated and what's being glorified in, in um in certain uh from certain political uh figures it's like not not only condoned right. but like 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 champions proud of it proud of it yes and it's just like okay forget all the artist stuff forget all the black man stuff forget all the i'm a human being man Word. like and if i see this happening like i gotta say something and if mm. it's my twitter if it's here you know come on man it's like you can't be silent and watch somebody like glorify uh marginalizing um people's power you know and anyway i don't want to get too political up, no, in, this, no, up in this mud scratching no, I, I got you but you got you know to be fair to be human you got kids you want to give this world to right and as a father as a father you want them to inherit a world that's empowering right. at least where they feel like they have a voice and they can say it's always on the back of my mind it's like i got a 26 year old daughter who's out here like making her way right now beautifully and i'm so proud of her and I, my wife and i by the way it's our anniversary today hey. uh, victoria won't be no secret right. i See? forgot the words tony 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 <laughs> it's anniversary oh uh, so look look maddie and jason don't know that song man i know that's going Do back See, you know oh. what today is we harmonize oh. bro oh, oh. God, yeah. hey <laughs> Y'all don't know that white song? White people, y'all know that? So white. You know that, man. It's Come disgusting. on, Tony, Tony, Tony. It's not even that they white, it's that they also disgusting. Well, it's it's, a, it's an age too, thing, man. right? They're like, they, you're 16, he's about right, I bet 19. This watch this, watch this, though. He got hair on his face, so he's probably 21. Watch this, watch this, though. He just beat it up. He just got that sticky cup. Oh, you hey, know that? I'm about beat it up. Yeah, yeah. Y'all know that one? I know that. That's that 6'9". What is that? Yeah, y'all know okay. that. Yeah, whatever, okay. man. Y'all check it out. <laughs> um, 
Uh, yeah, but you know, so I, I get it. I get it. I get it that you know people people want it. that was gum on man. But that's that's the whole that's a whole fucking song. Shout you know out to six nine. We're gonna make that a gift and like actually like put you in the music video. Now. Put me in the music videos, <laughs> God, gang. Oh, that's the whole shit. Um, speaking of rap, I'm going back to rap. What goes through your mind? Because I can think of two instances. Yeah, when you hear your name in a rap song. Oh wow. Yeah. Uh, what goes first of all? Two times I can remember. Uh, I remember common. common. I knew- <laughs> Because I'm like, comment I understood because it was fairly close, close to, to chronologically that, that whole time. But, but for and me, then, and then Hove just like last, <laughs> last for me from my perspective, right. since you asked the question, like you got to understand. I mean, people still like to talk about that, but that was like 15 years, 15 ago. years ago. So for me, it's like a whole nother like whole lifetime Life, ago. Like a lifetime ago. And yeah, so yeah, yeah. when somebody brings it up. I'm Man, that was like you, like you. You still talking? So, you know how how like in terms of that, and you guys, people know Jay Z said. I got a I got a funny story too. Oh, I want to hear it. What's the like? like so it's not really that funny. It's mm-hmm. just that um, my wife and I we were at um, we were at Quincy's. Uh, Quincy's Quincy had this. Um, Quincy say, is like my say, god. When you say Quincy, you mean Quincy, Quincy Jones? Jones. All I right, mean, real, that real quick, like, pause. Pause. Pa- 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 pause yeah. the podcast real quick. Yeah. Uh, pause. I'm, I'm gonna pause Eric Benet. I'm gonna keep going. What What just happened was what I like to call famous nigga speak. <laughs> so, so he said Quincy. Okay. <laughs> Quincy to him is Quincy Jones. Right. Quincy to people listening to this, Quincy might be your cousin or one of your brothers or something right. like that. Eddie to him is probably Eddie Murphy. <laughs> if he were to say <laughs> Sam, me, me and, probably Sam Jacks. Probably Sam Jacks. <laughs> like, he were to say like, yo, I was hanging out with B and M. That's Barack and Michelle. <laughs> uh, all right. So when he said Quincy, he's talking. That's his life. Our lives. Quincy is that nigga we went to high school with. His life. <laughs> who probably still owe you some money. Who probably still owe you some money. Right, right, right. So right, that's right. Quincy Jones. Right, right, Pick right. up the story now. So... Mm-hmm. Uh, that's a whole nother story in itself because uh, he, like so many people, um, he's just like, I love that man so much for so many reasons. Uh, but he was just like, he's just like a godfather. Oh, he's because when I was godfather. going through, when I was going, well, you know, right. Uh, anyway, we don't got to talk, talk about it. Let, let me tell the original. Tell story. the original story. Saying. So. Quincy. You pump faking on me. <laughs> you, <got> like, <laughs> pump fake you pump faking. You pump faking on me. <laughs> tell the original story though. So. Quincy had an event at his house and, um, you know, as you could imagine being at Quincy's house, it's like, for those of you who don't know, like you do, like mm-hmm. public service announcement, Quincy Jones is legend produced, is responsible for what we know in the lexicon today as Michael Jackson's success. But uh, like he, it, before Michael Jackson, we're talking about like, oh my gosh, we're talking about Frank Sinatra, Ray Charles, Ray Charles, like, Frank Sinatra, Miles Shaka Davis, Khan, like he's Miles really, Davis. Yeah, like, you know, it's ridiculous. So, but we got to keep reference so that they know you. what the hell we're talking about. Yeah. Michael Jackson, y'all know Michael Jackson. Mm-hmm. So anyway, Quincy, Quincy Jones is like musical God and just like humanitarian and all this stuff. So anyway, he's got this, uh, of course, a philanthropic event at his house. And as you can imagine, there's all kinds of somebody at the house. And this, <laughs> the whole, um, Never go Eric Benet thing had probably come out. Um, Jay Z on 444 said, Never go Eric Benet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Like the girl in the world. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> so yeah. it was fairly recent. I right. think it came out maybe a month prior or something. So I was basically, uh, you know, it was fresh. Right. And so my wife and I are posted up in Quincy's house having cheese fondue or whatever. That's a lie because I'm lactose intolerant. But well, you know, whatever, we were, whatever we are eating and drinking, in walks uh, the man himself, Quincy, Jay Z, Hove, yeah, wow. So he walks in. He's coming in the front door, and I'm thinking to myself, oh, I gotta, I gotta him, steal I gotta, on this I, nigga. I, I gotta give him some shit. Bust this nigga's ass. <laughs> no, not like that. Right. But he came up, and we, and he saw me, and he smiled, and so I just walked up. Oh, God. It's not really much of a story, but I was just like, this nigga. <laughs> <laughs> and he just started laughing and we hugged each other and it was oh like so it was no him. static no, so nothing like that nothing like that at all the common one no hurt nah the common one didn't really hurt the common one was just like uh, it, it wasn't hurt it was just like really 
It, mm. re it, it reached that far? Okay. Listen, I'm, I'm going to be real with you. For, not specifically on that. I'm, I, I want to know what it feels like to have something so personal. Yeah. So to become like a, a, a cultural touching point. Right. Or like, um, you know, because you, you, you talked very openly about your sex addiction and things like that. What is that like to have that become something? Well, well, it's it's uh, first. Let me touch. On, let me touch on what you, what you just said. So, um, ah, shoot, do I want to go there? Whatever. Uh, the Red Pill Podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Let's skim let's, over. Let's skim to, over. Let, let, let's not do it. Listen. Red pill, blue red pill. pill. Red, red pill, pill, blue you pill. You gotta take Is the there a purple pill. option? No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> you want to take the purple pill? You want to take the purple pill? All right. So wait. Go back. Oh, how does it feel? Mm -hmm. So. I mean, it feels weird. Mm -hmm. it, it would be like, and, and it also feels like when things, like the whole cult of celebrity or the perception of celebrity is always like, is bullshit. It's mm -hmm. like the perception that people have of what's really going on is completely different from like what's actually happening. Or, um, I shouldn't say completely different. Obviously, it's 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 like a really interesting um, story that's uh, subtly based on truth. Hmm. So when when I hear when like I hear in the movie, right, like I, it, like like some names are changed to protect this and some right. different situations. This is based on right. based on a real story, but right. there are certain things like they might done. do they might do a story about a a a, 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 a bank heist or something. Um, and yeah, they might've got the city right and they might've got the amount of money taken, but like right in the third act of the movie, like one Wonder Woman showed up and yeah. like, right, 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 right. it's like, yeah, that kind of happened, but not like, mm -hmm. not like that. So anyway, um, it feels weird because, um, you're listening to a perception, like, like a diffused perception of reality. And that perception is through the lens of what it must feel like. Uh, uh, of of the way the story has been told through the lens of, no offense, like TMZs or the, oh, or, the sure. or, or the tabloids or this that and the other. It's like mm -hmm. yeah, y'all got kind of the. I mean yeah, that happened, but right. it ain't go down like that. So when when it's um, when it's talked about, it's always very strange because it's not very obviously not very accurate, and mm -hmm. it's always the best position for me just to. Be quiet. I'll be honest with you. Away. I'll be honest with you because I, I, you know, I think about stuff like that, and I thought that you even dealt with that like really well. And the reason why I felt like you dealt with it really well is because I was having um, people like quote that lyric to me that I know fucking well have no idea what really happened because they're too young. Right? Did it bother you at all to have that kind of thing drummed up for a brand? I think new at generation? this point. At this point, like I'm so used to, uh, for the past 25 years of my life, like being in the public eye, like being in the public eye and understanding, like y'all don't really know what the real story is. Not just about myself, but about so many people that right. they don't even really face me. Bother you? Um, what's family like for you, like now, man? Family life is awesome, man. Happy anniversary to me and my wife. Mm -hmm. um, we have an incredible four-year-old who uh, I talk to other moms and dads that have four-year-olds and like my four-year-old and six-year-olds I, I think they're geniuses man Jesus i mean i know Christ. i'm like <laughs> it's Jesus true Christ, man. man let it's me like, get let me get my brother on the phone so he can tell you right now how smart my nephew and them is man. exactly All i know everybody like, like, like <laughs> everybody feels that way but i have these philosophical conversations with with my with my six-year-old daughter mm -hmm. And like my four-year-old daughter just asked the most incredible questions. And so it's just like family life is, is, is wonderful. And, it's, you know, I'm doing it all over again mm. because India is 26. Uh -huh. India is going through all the things that 26-year-olds go through. Trying to, trying to find trying herself. Trying to find herself, trying to find her money, money, trying to like creatively and artistically and professionally like uh, 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 galvanize and, and formulate who she is and and I'm being a part of it as much as she will allow me to mm -hmm. and um, you know so and then to start all over again um, at six and four it, it's 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 a challenge man mm. it's a challenge but it's it's a beautiful challenge I would imagine so bro 
do you do things differently? Do you look at your like, because like my like my pops has like a six year old son, and it's completely different. It's incredible. First of all, with India, I was a single, I was a single father, Word. so a lot of people don't know this about me. But India, um, India, my India's mom died when India was fifteen months mm-hmm. old. So right, so I became like instant um, single dad. Right. So imagine, <laughs> imagine Eric Benet at like in his you know twenty something trying right. to figure out how to like just you know be mom and dad and be everything for somebody. Um, it was the most incredible challenge of my life, and I leaned on my family and my mom and my sisters a lot, but. Um, so that was incredibly difficult. And now I look at India today and I'm so proud of the woman that she is. And That's amazing. So, but this time around, I have a partner. Mm. I don't have just any partner. I have like my wife who is like the most detail oriented, like, <laughs> you know, like um, she is a solid, solid rock of a partner. So um, uh, it, it, it feels like Great. I have a, I have a, I'm grateful to have a, a, a partner this mm. time around um, mm. raising these two incredible young ladies. Now your wife very famously dated Prince. She did. Uh, before. She did. She not only dated him, but she was married to him. Married to Prince? Yes, for three years. What the hell is it like the first time you That's talk an to interesting a woman story. And you, and you figure out that, because I'm not going to lie, I'm sitting down, I'm talking to somebody, right? It's like, hey, how are you? What's going on? Right. He's like, yeah, it's like exes and stuff like that. Then she goes, yeah, my ex was Prince. I go, ha, ah, it was nice meeting you. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason why I do that is because there's a level of swag. Yeah. And, you know, you're yeah. there, and yeah. I'm, I drive a Honda Accord that, like, I Ain't nobody like, going to reach Prince's swag. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, it was like, can I tell you that was the most, that's a story, too. Mm-hmm. So let me tell you that story. So this was like, um, you know. What, what is it now, like 11 years ago or whatever it was. And I was at a... By the way, God rest Prince's soul. Yes, God absolutely. Soul. Please, yeah. yes. Um, I was at a, 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 a function for LA, I think it was LA Fashion Week, and it, it was like an after party. Mm-hmm. And it was probably me and one of my boys, we were just out, you know, trying to see, you know, what we were saying. Yeah, yeah, you know what I'm saying? So, <laughs> so I just saw this young lady at the bar, and I was like, bruh. What the hell is that? So I did my, uh, you know, best. Um, let me walk over to the bar and try to be suave routine. Right. And apparently it kind of worked because Word. we started having a conversation. And I was now, like, did she know who you were? Probably. Okay. Probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so we started to have a conversation and it was really dope. And I started to learn more about her and how her whole world was about philanthropy and this, that, and the other. I had no idea about the prince. I had no idea. So we're seeing each other for like a couple months. Mm-hmm. And during those couple months, she was telling me that she was going through a divorce. Mm. And she would tell me like <clears throat> certain aspects of the divorce. And I'm not, you know, I'm, I'll let her tell that story. Uh, but basically some of the details she, she would tell me because uh, without going into too deep, too much detail, it would just be like, the terms were just so grandiose. Right. <laughs> it was like, all right, all right, all right. It was like uh, ev- everything, like if regular people are going to, through a divorce, it's like the conversation is a certain conversation. Yeah. But imagine if Bill Gates was getting divorced, it'd be like- You have to have a much larger fucking like, conversation. Like, and it's just not money. It was just like grandiose things. Yeah, 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 sure. So I'm thinking, and her name is Testolini. So for some reason, I thought she was married to some Italian Some cat. Italian shipping magnate. Right. Or so, something like that. So I'm thinking right. something along those lines. So I'm thinking, so finally, we had been seeing each other for like a couple months. Uh-huh. And I never asked her who he was. I would just like listen and, and, and give my thoughts and my ideas on like all her frustrations and what she was going through. And finally, I was, I was driving her to the airport because uh, at that point we were like, yeah, now we, it's, we were hanging out. We were right. seeing each other. Now, because we you know, if you go into the airport, it's fucking right, serious. right. Because if you go, if you for your, those who don't live in LA, if you drive, if you offer to drive somebody to the airport, that's you either your 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 not just your brother, your sister, but your favorite brother, or sister, right? 
or or somebody that you, you just might as well stop on the way and get the engagement ring on exactly. the way if you're driving to the LAX. Exactly. Ain't nobody going out there for all that hail. bullshit. Yeah. It's hail. Fuck all that. So anyway, <laughs> <laughs> we driving to the airport and she gave me some other detail and finally I was like, who is this guy? Uh-huh. And she looked at me and she was like, you you really don't know. And I'm like, no, I mean, I, never I love asked. it when women do that. You right. really don't know. Yeah. Nah, man, you ain't like, I'm me asking you because yeah. I don't know. It's like you telling me all this crazy shit. And it's like yeah, the life y'all lived. I'm right. like, who is this nigga? Like, right. what? <laughs> like wow. <laughs> and so she just kind of laughed and she was just like, it's it, it, Prince. Right. I'm like Prince who? Like, pr- like, like, <laughs> like, like <laughs> Prince. Like, and then she was like Prince, Prince. And I'm right. like, and then I started, you know, that like if you're watching a Guy Ritchie movie or something, <laughs> and you start seeing all, right. you going back to all the stories, and it's like, oh, oh, mm. oh, it was that kind of thing. And so, um, yeah, that's pretty much how I found out. But by that time, we were already like. Whoopity whoop, poopity scooping it. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So he was like, "Yeah, it's a whole bunch of lingerie that wasn't hers." Now I know <laughs> who it was for. Rest in peace, of Prince. So let absolutely. Me you, so I mean, let me ask you this though, and this is—I I wondered this when I first found this out. So you're a musician. Yeah. So do you ever? Right. <laughs> right. So, so it's you ever like, ever like, like, yo. yo. So usually, usually, <laughs> if I'm dating somebody and I invite them to the studio, right. it's like, that's a thing. <laughs> that's like a big thing. It's like, right. wow, I get to see how you create. And this is so fascinating. Uh-huh. And then once I found out it was Prince, you like, like, wow, I ain't shit, man. <laughs> I ain't, shy, I ain't impressing her with no <laughs> nothing bullshit I'm doing in right. my studio is the size of like probably from the middle yeah. of the table to the wall. Right. And I'm like, oh wow. Man. Yeah, so. Did you ever did you ever be like, oh, you know, I'm in the middle of a song, man. Yo, I drums might not be sounding quite right, or I have to play a melody. You think maybe you think <laughs> maybe any any did you ever think about collaborating with him? Because he could think about any, any any musician in the world. Yeah, wants to collaborate I mean, any I always say any musician out there right now owes a debt to Prince. I mean, a doubt. owes a debt, like whether you do rock, whether you do country, whether you are a hip hop artist, mm-hmm. like. We're all standing on the shoulders of that kind of greatness. Yeah. So would you have worked with him? If he would have asked. Yeah. <clears throat> Absolutely. Right. I wouldn't have reached out to try to make it. That would have like really <laughs> messed up some, you know. Yeah. Some, that, right. You know. But um, if he would have asked, absolutely. Mm. I remember one time, this was like way before, way before even my first marriage, I think. I think I was still living in Milwaukee and Prince came out to do a show in Milwaukee. And I think my Eric Benet thing had just kind of started to happen. Kind of pick up, yeah. And Prince saw me in the audience. <clears throat> And, and he was like, come on up here. You know, it's like the, he, it was like the point in the show. It's the, he did all this thing, and then he would just invite some people to come up on stage. And he saw me in the audience, and he told me to get up. Come on up here, man. I was like, all right. So, you jam with him? I didn't. That's the thing. What? It, it was what? like, man, here's the thing. Here's the thing. I, I kick myself about this, like, to this day. But it's like, when you respect somebody, like, like to me, Prince is like on a whole nother level of respect yeah. musically. So when he pulled me on stage, first of all, that just tripped me out. First of all, oh, you mean, nigga, you know who I am. And then you're going to ask me to yeah, come to yeah, your stage. Yeah, yeah. So I was blown away that I was on his stage. And then he was like doing some, he was doing some jam, like, like they were just jamming out on the vamp or something. And he was, he was just singing, you know, doing his little brilliant improvisational things. And then he would hand me the mic. But I was just so like, damn, that was such a dope run. I was like, right, no, right, right, it again. Right, right. And so he was saying something else, and he put the mic in my face. I'm like, right. nah, I'll do it again. So then he laughed. He got off the stage. But before I left the stage, he said, next time I invite your ass on stage, you better sing some shit. You ever see when he kicked Kim Kardashian off the stage? Y'all never I saw, saw that. I yeah, saw he, that. he asked Kim to come up and dance, and Kim wasn't trying to shake nothing. Get your ass right, off right, my right, stage, right, right, right. man. I want to ask you about R&B music right now. Yeah. Eric, yep. there are two types of, of, of elder statesmen. Mm. There are the elder statesmen that go, I really love what these <laughs> young cats are doing right, right now. Right, 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 
I really love the, the snappity snap of these cats. Click it, clack. Click it, it clacks. And all with these. And then there's the other type of elder statesman. It's the elder statesman that goes, this shit ain't music. Right, 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 right. right. What's all these corn rolls and synthesizers? <laughs> and That's not when I was doing it. We used to really get down on the guitar and stuff like yeah. that. Which category do you fall I'm in? somewhere in the middle. Mm. I'm somewhere in the middle because... I agree with both of those old crotchety uh, men right. that you just pretty accurately described. I mean, I think when I listen to when I when I do a br a blanket listen and don't quiz me because I don't know the names of, of most of them. I'm okay. I'm really an old man in that respect. But it, whenever I you know listen to do you have anybody that you do particularly yes, like? and I'm getting to that. Mm -hmm. So when I listen to some of the stuff that's really really being glorified, it's like awesome. I don't get it mm -hmm. because uh, a lot of it, not all of it, a lot of it, because, yes, a lot of it is y using technology as a crutch. Mm -hmm. You can hear the uh, you can hear in the production that it's not really musicians, but it's like a loop. And you can hear that the vocal isn't really organic. It's mm -hmm. been like auto tuned to hell. Or, uh, and and it's just like. I appreciate it because in those rare instances where I'm hanging out with my 26 year old daughter and we might mm -hmm. be somewhere in a club or something, I'm like, okay, yeah, this is fun to dance to. But um, I grew up in an era, you have to understand old men like me. I grew up in an era. I ain't that old. I'm 51. Yeah, that's not that different. That's, I got my AARP card, man. That's <laughs> geriatric up in this muscle. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I grew up in an era mm. where you would go to the studio and if you did not have the chops, you would either get like laughed at or lovingly told, look, why don't you like work on this? Your pitch is kind of jacked up. Yeah. Your lyrics are whack, you know, and you, you probably need to work on these couple things. So you would, you would figure out what aspects of your musical prowess was lacking and you would work on it. Mm -hmm. And then you would come back to the studio and if you did your homework, you were better. Work. So uh, that's kind of the era that I grew up in. So it's it's very natural for me to see somebody live who can't sing and be like, ah, oh, he's whack. Or she, oh my God, she can't even hold on to a note. She can't finesse a note. Oh my God. So, but then the other part of that is I'm hearing a lot, a lot of young, like a, a minority of, of, of young artists that are really, really embracing that musicianship and that mm -hmm. instrumental uh, uh, like using real instruments and in, in, in real production. Um, and it's interesting because when I listen to it now, it sounds like the stuff that we were doing, we, I mean, like my contemporaries, like the Music Soul Childs or the NDRE or the Maxwell or the whoever, like we were doing in the 90s when we were paying homage to 60s and 70s mm -hmm. artists. It sounds like when they're doing it now, they're paying homage to, to like us, right. basically. So um, I, I hear I hear some promising artists out there that are that are really really talented and it's very exciting. And you like that? Um, is R and B dying? Is soul music dying? And the reason why I'm asking you this is because there are versions of it right now. There are versions of it. They have some really great artists out. You got guys like Bryson Tiller. You got guys like. Um, Lead. You got all kinds of your Frank Ocean, yeah, guys like that that are really making some exciting. Uh, one guy named Brent Faiz, Faiz. See, I, I'm so like old, but he's man. he's, he's relatively. I love yeah, that guy. I ain't hip. It's like so, like th those guys, but like he, he's relative. He's just kind of getting his getting his way up. Um, but it it seems like almost the niche is it's growing smaller and smaller. Yeah, you it think is. R and B is dying. Um, I I I. I I think what I think of, like when I think of R&B, I think of rhythm and blues. And right. to me, rhythm and blues is like playing something and singing something and meaning it and having beautiful imperfections in the, you know, it's, 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 it's the passion and the imperfections that make it so dope. And mm -hmm. I think that is not celebrated anymore. It's like too quantized, too polished, too uh, um, sync. Uh, it's, it's just, the, the, the art form that I fell in love with is not dying, but it's still there. It just see, you know what it seems like? It seems like they want to 
hear it, but they want to hear it more if it's not from black people. Interesting. Like Adele, Sam yeah. Smith situation. Yeah. Like, you know what? Tyrese was on that a couple of years ago. Um, <clears throat> he When he, uh, shout out to Tyrese, we had him on the podcast a couple of- uh, What up, man? Uh, had, had him on the podcast a couple of weeks ago. Um, he, I think it was three or four years ago, had a very, very big movement <clears throat> that was saying, listen, you know, when you have like Adele or Sam Smith, or um, by the way, these are fantastic artists. Yeah. Um, uh, they're doing the type of music. Why that is it genius when they do it? Mm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so, yeah. I, so I, I like I, I I feel Tyrese on that. It's like like you know like yeah. You listen listen to Kenny Lattimore's latest record, and it's like wow, that's dope. Right. But if it was a white cat who came out with that record, he'd be at the Grammys. Why do you think that is? Um, because I think that's always been the way the music industry has been from Elvis on. You know, you could sing ain't nothing. You know. He could sing "Ain't Nothing But a Hound Dog," and you know Perry Como can sing. You know that's that's just always the way the music industry has been. And you think it's getting worse now, or do you think, like, because there's a there's a school of thought, and because when we had this argument, there was a school of thought that said over in London, where some of those artists are from, they really love that style of music, mm-hmm. and they're buying into it more than what we buy into it here. Do they you, appreciate it. You th- you think that's true at all? I think, I mean, just from my travels in Europe, I think there is a, a greater appreciation for what I consider to be like authentic feeling R and B. You know, I, absolutely. Mm. Yeah. yeah, there's, there's. Uh, I, I don't know. It just seems, and I could be. This could be just the old crotchety man in me coming out. <laughs> but it just seems over here the emphasis is, and the attraction seems to be more, in the personality or the life drama, mm-hmm. or the braggadociousness or the bravado and the lyrics um, as opposed to like really outstanding like musical prowess. Right. You know, right. And, and, and I think in, in Europe and other parts of the world, they really, they really like, like first time I went to Japan was a trip um, because, you know, now back in the day, liner notes, when I was, when I was coming up, like you would get your album, pop it open, pop it credits. open. It was such a, a, a tactile, romantic like experience. You go to the record your, store. Your best friend Jay Z even said he said in a, in a, in an intro he said you're probably reading the credits right now. He said you just popped my CD open. Yeah, you're probably reading the credits. Yeah, right exactly. Because that's what yeah you did exactly. And even going further back than CDs, when I was ten and eleven years old, I would go to the record store and the, the thumbing through the. You know the crates, oh, the peach crates, and then, yeah. and then the smell, and then you you open it up and you get the read. Who produced that? Who did that? So it's like now, like with streaming and this, that, and the other people, it, it's, it's almost sacrilegious. They don't really care about who made it because it's just about an immediate feeling of, mm-hmm. you know. But going back to what I was originally going to say, like the first time I went to Japan, um, and I experienced this in Europe as well. It would be like, you know, that I'd be doing an interview. Uh, this has been a great interview so f- so far. Not unless you ask me some real messed up shit. Yeah. But this has been a, r- a real great interview. I'm just messing <laughs> with you. But but so, you know sometimes with interviews here, it's just like okay, you get the same questions over and over. Again. Yeah. In Japan and in Europe, it's like okay. So I noticed on this song, uh, uh, you know, you had Pino Palladino as a bass player, but then you decided to use another bass player on this so song. Like why? Like music. yeah. So why did you? to make the change on that and i you know the, the 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 string arrangement was less prominent in this i'm like wow you guys not only really listen to my shit, but you like read the notes and you mm-hmm. came prepared because because they're passionate about it they're passionate about about the details right and i don't think we're as passionate about the details of this as much we're just the packaging means package more. passionate about the packaging and the 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 sizzle of the steak as mm-hmm. as opposed to the meat of the steak mm. I wrote down a name when you were talking. I want to ask you specifically about this artist. Shamong. Why didn't we appreciate Indy Ari more? Wow. Indy Ari right. is a beast. Phenomenal she artist. She is a guy. beast. And, like, and India, like the most beautiful person. Like, like Indy Ari came out, and I remember, uh, I guess she got nominated for something like seven or eight Grammys. too good. And then they shut her out of the Grammys and India was here making fantastic music and I just don't what was it why didn't we appreciate India I think anymore? every generation gets the icons that they deserve and I think like in like I mean 
hey, look at who's president right now. Mm-hmm. Look at, like, you know, if, if, you, uh, if you are able to be enough of a train wreck on any given reality show, you're, an, you're a huge star. India was just too good and had, not was, I'm talking about her like giving her, a, like, you know, She's still doing her thing. She's yeah. still doing her thing. But yeah. I'm talking about when she first came out. It was like, yeah, people recognized it because, wow, that's dope. And then she did it again. And it's like, nah, we want to we want to see what's happening over here now, because I don't know. I just felt like her musicianship and, and the message of what she said was just so positive and not like uh, congruent with what, um, you know, was basically what what was happening in in the entertainment world and in the world in general i just think people just want people want to hear bullshit right they want to hear bullshit they want to hear like stuff that's uh watered down and they want to hear like repetition um they don't want to be challenged uh musically the cool thing about hip-hop i think people want to be challenged lyrically right you know and that's Ah. dope yeah. Well, maybe, uh, maybe not. I mean, I think, yeah. I think we're getting back to that a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Maybe not as much now. Yeah, but. I think we're getting back to it a little bit. But you know, I think there was a point where, like, you were listening to Nas, and it was really more, the the beat would drown out, and really the sound of his voice was what you was listening to. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? I think there's such there's such talent behind the boards now with production, and mm. so you know the the beats are so it the stuff. Listen. If you're gonna be a musical purist, you could pretend like you don't like what Metro or what what um what what Murder Beats or what Boy Wonder or what you know. But the thing is, it the the drums and the shit it hits you. It's like right. it sounds good. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? It's yeah. dope. Like you know what I'm saying? Like and you can't you you can't you can't deny deny that. that. Like they they they're talented. You know. Right. Um. Overall, do you feel like do you feel like Eric Benet's well, well, how would you sort of sum up your musical career thus far? Like, what, what, what have you? What did you set out to do? And I always have this question to where, if twenty-one-year-old Eric Benet is looking at fifty-one-year-old Eric Benet, what does he think about what he sees? Um, that's a great question, man. That's a really great question. Um, I think, uh, I don't know, twenty-one-year Eric Benet would probably look at 51 year old Eric Benet and be like, damn, damn, I still got all my hair. Yeah, damn, bro, you still sexy, man. <laughs> you still working it, man. I still got all my hair, man. Head. Shit, I'm Everything fucking Everything still it. work. <laughs> we good, we gonna be good. So, no, but I think, um, I don't know, I think my 21 year old self would be proud. Mm. I think because I think when I did my first solo album, like that's pretty much what I set out to do. I set out, to make a career that was not um, reliant on trends. Mm-hmm. It wasn't reliant on like wh- whatever the, uh, the the fads were at radio or this, that, and the other. I just loved a particular style of music where um, the singing comes from my soul, the music, the, the instruments are played live. And, my bad. and, mm-hmm. um, and um, you know, like this authentic, thing and i've pretty much consistently done that like my whole career um it hasn't always been you know at the top of the charts but you know i've been able to to grow as a musician and as a man and maintain my life like you know pretty much unapologetically still doing what i set out to do so if you're talking to a young musician and he asks you you know one piece of advice that you feel like because let's be real um and we hear it all the time. Cole has a song called uh, 1985. Mm-hmm. And in the song, he's talking to a young rapper that's riding trends. Mm-hmm. And when he's talking to this young rapper, he's telling him, he's actually, he breaks it down when we talk about one of the lyrical geniuses that we have. Cole mm-hmm. is definitely one of them. Agreed. <clears throat> and he's talking to the kid. And he's basically saying, listen, you're, you're hot because you're riding trends. He's like, what I'm doing right now, right. I'm going right. to be A1 forever. Right. You know what I mean? I'm always going to be able to do what I'm doing right now because my talent is there. Yeah. To to someone right now that wants to have longevity right. in music, Right. what's your best piece of advice? I would say that. I would say that when you follow trends, you're, you're, you're following, you're, 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 you're basically setting yourself up for a seasonal career. Mm-hmm. And um, I think... Um, 
one thing that never goes away is authenticity and creativity. I mean, people are always going to love that. They, they're going to love it when you're authentic, whether you're, 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 you're saying your piece of what happened in your life or whether you're in the studio being completely uninhibited and not chasing any sound or fad or, or um, you know, you're just like connected to the source, mm. to the creative source. And it's just the conduit for you. And you're just like, I don't know where this shit is coming from right now, but give me a mic, boom, give me a guitar, boom. You know, and I think when you create with the spirit of that kind of authenticity, you got a real shot at yeah. being here 30, 40 years from now and people still talking about you. And, and you will go through these cycles where what you do, the shit you're doing really ain't that hot because people either ain't really caught up to it yet or they forgot how dope it used to be. Mm. All right. This is a question. This is the last question of the podcast. All right. All right. All right. Eric There's so many people in here. Yeah. I like that girl in the front. Yeah, you so like her right there? That's, uh, that's Tasha. Tasha. What's up, Tasha? What's up, Tasha? What's up, Tasha? There's really yeah. no Tasha, guys. <laughs> Eric Benet is talking to an empty He's couch. He's talking to an empty Eric couch. Eric Benet right, just had Clint a Eastwood. Clint Eastwood. <laughs> ah! <laughs> he just had a Clint Eastwood moment. Right. Eric Benet, Clint Eastwood. Y'all don't, y'all don't, do y'all not even get that Netflix reference convention. back then? You get that? Yeah, Republican you get that reference? Okay, just making yeah, yeah, sure because yeah, yeah, yeah. we, we up here vibing. Y'all know, man. React, react. Y'all Nigga, come, on, there, man. Fucking, <laughs> come on, man. Come on, man. You actually get a room after this. Wait, Shut up. the fuck up. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so, uh, last question Aliens descend upon the earth. Yes. Are they female or are they male? They are unisex. Ooh. They have both sets of organs. Wow. They use what they need at the time. This is the way I envision aliens. I don't envision aliens in the humanoid form that we do. Aliens, they, they came here. They're nomadic. They, they, they want to uh, seek out a new life form. Right? Yeah. So they're here. Right. They come to Eric Benet. And they say, Eric Benet, we're going to destroy the Earth. Mm -hmm. Okay. We've scouted out galaxies all over the universe. And we don't think this planet is worthy. Mm -hmm. You have to give me one album. Mm. to restore my faith in humanity. One album to restore faith in humanity. Wow. This piece of music has to be so engaging. It has wow. to be so sort of uh, rapturing. It has to be so great that we're going to say these people are too beautiful to destroy. Wow. What piece of music are you going to play for these aliens? with dicks and vaginas. Dicks and vaginas? They have dicks and vaginas. Do they, did they come out at the same time? It depends. Like, it depends right. on what you're into, right? Right. Because it's like, maybe the dick comes out, right? And then and they then, follow it up and with some a vagina. Right. You know what I'm saying? Or maybe wow. maybe they go dick from Monday to Wednesday, vagina for the weekend. Full Who knows? Full service. Yeah. Full service. OK. Real so quick, like, question so, to Maddie. So if like, you, Maddie, if you could oh. have a dick and a vagina, would you have the dick on the weekends or would you have the vagina on the weekend? Which one would you say for the weekends? The dick or the vagina? Like, is the alien dick like pretty close to human size? Kind of like, the same have, thing. Like, just, I think it's a regular okay. dick. A regular I think dick. I'm gonna stick with the dick. You're yeah. gonna stick with the dick okay. on the weekends? Yeah, yeah. And they go vagina on the weekdays? I don't know. I mean, I just said stick with the dick. That's Does he all, have that's to? All I said. No, you have to switch it Does up. Does he have to switch it up? And no, you no, you have to switch it up because your dick gets sore after like three days uh, okay. of being out. Yeah, so. okay. Yeah, dick on the weekends. Dick on the weekends, yeah. vagina on the weekends, and then go to Jamaica when you have the vagina. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, All right. So, what piece of music are you gonna play for these unisex aliens? That is so difficult because as you were setting that question up, like five albums came to my head. Mm -hmm. First, the first one while you were talking was like like Tchaikovsky's Sixth Symphony. Oh wow. That yeah, like, and then it was just like um, Ella Fitzgerald and uh, Sachimo. Like they did so many albums that blew me away. Like mm -hmm. I could look and anything by Duke Ellington and then the Beatles. And then mm -hmm. I was like, ah, so I got to pick one. That's one. difficult. One. one. So if it's one, it's probably going to have to be Stevie Wonder's Talking Book. Woo! Yeah. It's probably going to have to be that. Mm. Because he touches, like, first of all, like Stevie, I love Stevie always. But in that era, like he was touching on so many things. He was touching on jazz. He was touching on philanthropy he was touching on equal rights he was touching on like like 
like making R and B what it is today. It mm-hmm. was just like so much. So for those kiddies out there, go out there listen to Stevie Wonder's Talking Book. Guess what? Say, I thought you were gonna say songs in the key of life. That's, that's great. That that's an amazing album. That is. A, I don't want to take anything away from Songs in the Key of Life, but that's that's the same conversation to me as it is Michael Jackson, Thriller or Off, off the, the Wall. wall. Exactly. It's like Thriller, I'm an Off the Wall course. guy. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. Because yeah. Thriller, of course, was just like this moment in history Mm -hmm. but for me as a musician and like the beautiful imperfections and michael being it's like off the wall Mm -hmm. guess what what's going on guess what eric what fucked up these aliens have youtube they wanted to hear that fucking new little pump we all dead (laughs) so like these aliens wanted to hear that trap shit they ain't trying to hear that conscious shit you want we're screwed we fucked up give it up for eric (laughs) benetia talk man oh, i love that eric tell us what you want us to consume of yours right now what are the things that you want people to buy and support and go listen to well you know download? what first i want you to go to my wife's website my wife is incredibly philanthropic and she's uh, celebrating the 12th anniversary of her nonprofit in a perfect world Reality. she's built 30 schools worldwide and we do all kinds of things from raising money oh, to amazing to, to public schools here in the states to drilling water drilling wells for water so please go to in a perfect world.org it's my wife manuela testolini's uh nonprofit. and then for me just follow me because i'm i'm in like a chill i'm i won't say chill mode because i'm busy working on some some things that i ought not talk about right oh, okay. now oh, but but Hollywood follow me. secrets no, little secrets <laughs> as it were but follow me on twitter um at ebene follow my crazy ass on uh instagram um at eric benet so you know Come get at me. We out.